There's no worse feeling in the world for a five-year-old, or any age really, than losing your parents in a public place. Times that by a crowd of thousands and triple the number of places they could be. And you have my absolute nightmare, especially in the baking sun of the Florida summer. Looking back, I would call myself a really codependent kid, getting anxious if my parents even went into the next style over at the grocery store and not really leaving the yard without them knowing, or at least another adult like my friend's mom or dad. So, when we took a trip to Disneyland in the foreign state of California, I knew I would be clinging to them like gum on the sidewalk. That didn't mean I wouldn't be having any fun, of course, just that I was going to be doing it exclusively with my folks in tow, and I was perfectly fine with that. My dad, though, was more of an independent fellow, and he wanted his only son to eventually fall into his footsteps and grow up to be a real man. While on this trip, he would make it a point to leave me alone for a couple of minutes at a time, while he and my mom looked at an attraction across the street or went to another place in the gift shop, increasing the time by a few seconds each time. Now, don't get me wrong here. He let me know where they'd be. It's not like he just up and left me there. And they'd come back right away if I got their attention. But still, it was anxiety-inducing being alone around all these people I didn't know. I knew my classmates and teachers at school and things like that, so that didn't really count when I was around crowds there. My mom comforted me if I started to cry, and said maybe my dad was being a bit too hard on me. But you really couldn't win with him. If he had something in his head, you'd be fighting him the entire day, if not more. This all came to a head on the third morning of our Disney trip, when my dad suggested he and my mom go grab some breakfast. While I waited in the hotel room by myself, to most kids, a chance to be alone and watch all the TV I wanted would be heaven. But I just remember a spike of adrenaline shooting through me, and the hotel floor practically falling away beneath me. I mean, I'd be in my room or out in the yard at home alone just fine, but they were always nearby. At the same time though, a big part of me looked up to my dad, and I wanted to make him proud. So, reluctantly, I put on a brave face and said I'd be fine. I hunkered down in front of the Disney Channel as they left, feeling like the whole room was closing in as the door shut behind them. After watching reruns of Good Luck Charlie and Ant Farm on repeat, I quickly got bored and tried to change the channel. Flipping through was the only way to combat my mounting anxiety. Apart from the TV, the room was too quiet. Too big, too unfamiliar for me to be comfortable, but the TV wouldn't change without a passcode for whatever reason. I guess I'd left it idling for too long. I tried to remember what the room passcode even was for what felt like forever, but I came up short. I could feel the anxiety starting to mount again as the TV played the same commercials over and over. Now I had nothing to forget that my parents weren't in the next room. In hindsight, I know now that I had an extreme undiagnosed anxiety disorder, but at the time, I had no idea what that was, or how to deal with it at all aside from distracting myself or finding them. And so, I chose the second option. I could hear my heart beating in my ears as I opened the door to our hotel room. We were on the ground floor, and technically, we were in a motel attached to the main resort so our door faced a small parking lot. I had been in that dark room so long with the curtains drawn that the sun reflecting off a bright blue car next to ours blinded me for a bit. I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to find them. I didn't know exactly where they were going, but my mom said before they left they'd be across the bug bridge to the left. I started walking down the road to the left, looking for any bridges or Disney-themed breakfast nooks I could find. A little bit difficult, considering nearly everything around me was Disney-themed. I walked far too long before I realized I didn't see anything that could be like what she was describing. Just the Cinderella castle a middle distance away, a looming presence and a beacon. Maybe someone there can help me find them, I thought. 
I ran to it as fast as my legs could carry me. Only even then I managed to get even more lost. The bright signs all seemed to look the same, and I couldn't read too well yet, so a map was out of the question. It was also, I learned later, rush hour at the Magic Kingdom area, so the streets were very congested with strangers going about here and there. None of them paid any attention to me. Not that I'd tried to get their attention in the first place. My breath grew short at the thought. I ended up just crouching in the corner for a minute, trying to make myself as small as possible, and trying not to cry while a Disney song played nearby. The people were really starting to close in. As I looked between my fingers, I realized why. Someone in a princess costume had strolled onto the corner and was greeting people and signing things. I recognized the yellow dress immediately. Belle, she was my favorite princess. We were going to do a picture opportunity with her later today, but if I couldn't find my way back, that would never happen. My blood rushed into my ears. My tears caked my face as they dried. I decided to be a man in that moment, even if a scared one. With shaking, wobbly legs, I cut the line and ran right up to Belle and said, Can you help me? You might know the rest of the story. Belle looked at the crowd of kids for a minute as if signaling the parents to come get theirs for cutting in line. A look of realization crossed her face though, and she asked me, Are you lost, honey? Maybe Beast can sniff out your mother and father if we ask nicely. I agreed, drying the tears from my face. This time, they were tears of relief, though. Apparently, my parents had been looking for me since they found the room empty and the door wide open. I guess in my panic, I'd forgotten to close it. The TV was still on, too, blaring more and more reruns. It must have looked a lot worse than it actually was, like I'd been kidnapped instead of just wandering off or something. They called the front desk, who called hotel security, and eventually it made its way through a good portion of the chain. By the time I'd asked Bell for help, my parents were considering calling the actual police and filing a missing persons report. My dad in particular felt guilty for his part to play in the incident. He apologized for leaving me scared and alone, and said we could wait until I felt ready to try something like that again. They hugged me and promised me a special dinner that night. With my favorite Disney princesses, I ended up sitting with the bell that waited with me until security could get my parents, and she was very wonderful. She chatted with me for a long time about anything and everything, and I still have her autograph, and a picture she let me get with her once my parents arrived to this day. I know this doesn't sound so scary. After all, there was nothing actively dangerous going on, but like I said, a kid getting lost in a huge crowd like that can be your worst nightmare. My name is Diane, and I'm here to tell you about my honeymoon with my wonderful husband, Cooper. We met only two years before we got married in college, and it was a whirlwind romance. I'd never met a more considerate, kind, or funny man in my entire life. We've been married for a total of five years now, and I can honestly say he's still my better half to this day. Our first date was to see 2017's Beauty and the Beast remake, and despite what people say about the live-action versions, we both found we actually really liked it. In fact, we make it a tradition to watch it on each of our anniversaries, or on special occasions significant to our relationship. Early on in the wedding planning, we decided to take the plunge and have our honeymoon at Disney. This would be our first major couples trip not sponsored by our school, so we had a huge learning curve ahead of us. Cooper had gotten a degree in finance, so he knew pretty well the ins and outs of trip planning, and I was more the bargain finder. This made it a lot easier than we'd thought it would be to plan for the trip, so despite all the stresses of slapping a wedding and honeymoon together, we never lost sight of what it was really all about, celebrating our love. Cooper and I, however, found ourselves in the middle of something straight out of a thriller, the first few days of the week-long trip were wonderful. 
we chose a tropical suite with a strong paradise theme. It had its own pool and hot tub and was close to a cute little Disney-themed breakfast place we wanted to try. Coop loved the Mickey-shaped waffles, by the way. Still likes to make them like that occasionally. It was pretty cozy room-wise and overall, especially for a newlywed couple. Without going into too many details, I knew I wanted a life and family with Cooper forever, and I was looking forward to four days of wedded bliss together. Day four started off just like all the others. I'm an early riser, while Cooper sleeps in a bit later, so I was up and brewing a cup of coffee for myself, while the sun crept higher through the morning, flooding the room with light slowly. By the time 10.30 rolled around, he shuffled out of bed to join me. He wrapped his arms around me and kissed the back of my neck before heading to the bathroom, mulling over the plans for the day out loud. That's how we decided to go to the Epcot Center that day, a spot we hadn't tried yet, and something different from the Magic Kingdom and other areas. We wouldn't be going on many rides, though. We just liked to soak up the atmosphere of a place at our own speed seeing what we could find while walking around. We'd meet all sorts of people, both tourists like us and cast members, and even had a couple take our picture in front of some cultural monuments. One of these people we met definitely stood out though, a large man that looked to be about his mid-forties. He introduced himself as Charles, and he towered over both of us. When he offered to take our picture in front of the Epcot Ball itself, I noticed him staring at me and not really making eye contact with Cooper. He seemed to be taking a little too long to snap one or two photos as well. Though, in his defense, we were facing the sun at the time, so I can't really say for sure. He was polite enough and quick to hand my phone back to me, but I couldn't shake how he never seemed to blink, especially when Cooper casually mentioned we were on our honeymoon. Oh, you're a lucky man, he said. That was the only time he acknowledged Cooper directly. Thanks, Coop said, drawing his arm around me. We excused ourselves and walked away. Coop teased me about having competition even on the honeymoon. I rolled my eyes and smacked his chest. Not a chance, I said. The rest of the day went really well, though I couldn't get Charles' creepy stare out of my head. I know some people can't help it or don't realize when they do it, but still, it gave me a little bit of a shiver each time I thought of the way he looked at me. We tried to just put it out of our minds and continue on with the day, but every once in a while I'd swear I'd catch him out of the corner of my eye. He didn't seem to be blatantly following us at least, just always ending up in the same general vicinity, but I kept my eyes out even closer after the third time. I mean, the parks aren't that small, right? We decided to go back to the hotel room after the sun started to set. We were tired and wanted some couple time together. Coop was whispering romantic sweet nothings into my ear the entire shuttle ride back, right up against my ear so the other passengers couldn't hear. His voice resonated warmly in my chest, ever the romantic. I had just cuddled into him when the shuttle stopped to let on more passengers, and who do I see walking down the aisle? Charles. Same clothes, same towering form, same creepy stare. He noticed us immediately, and in about the time it took me to think, please don't sit by us, he sat down right next to us, of course. Seriously, what are the odds here? Coop launched into the friendly thing and started trying to chat with him. Oh, it's you! Small world, huh? <laughs> Enjoy the parks for the day? I wasn't really listening, though. I was too busy glancing from Coop over to Charles. I noticed that once again, Charles wasn't paying any attention to Coop at all, even as he gave vague answers to his questions. His eyes just centered straight on me. If I felt a little uncomfortable feeling his gaze from a distance away, being glared at from point-blank range made my stomach nearly roll out onto the floor. My heart nearly stopped when Charles cut Coop right off and said, I can do you better, pretty lady. I can tell you like it rough. What? I couldn't stop the anger in my voice. 
Coop immediately dropped the nice act and went off on the guy, telling him not to talk to me like that and to leave us alone or else. We were starting to attract attention now, but Charles didn't seem to care. He simply said, come to my room if you change your mind. He rattled off a room number in our same resort. Great. Just great. Hell no, I said. My finger hovered on the emergency stop button above our seat. I wanted off this bus. I felt red hot angry, embarrassed and sick. I could tell Cooper was feeling the same. Some woman with her kids looked at me from across the aisle, concern plain on her face. I raised my eyebrows in an I don't fucking know way and pressed the button. The bus immediately came to a jerking stop. Coop and I leapt and ran out before Charles could even think about following. A security officer stopped by our room a short while later to ask us about the incident. Apparently, Charles went on a loud rant about how the pretty woman never see what he can offer and intimidated the other passengers to the point where the bus driver felt the need to call security and kick him out. They were even suggesting we submit a report to get him banned from Disney entirely, maybe even arrested on misconduct charges. Coop and I agreed. After all, the thought of him stalking another person felt awful. Even though he didn't do anything physically to me because we were always surrounded by people, the next girl who came alone might not have been so lucky. Regardless, Coop and I were still able to enjoy the rest of our honeymoon in the privacy of our own hotel room, and we never saw or heard anything about Charles ever again. I loved Disney's Dinosaur the Movie as a kid, and I mean I really loved it. I would watch it multiple times a week, sometimes every night even when my summer vacations were in full swing. I would fall asleep to the sounds of dinosaurs roaring their ways through different environments, drawn into the suspense every time. So, when I learned that there was, in fact, a ride solely based on that movie at Disney World in Florida, and we were scheduled to go in just a few months around my 11th birthday, I was absolutely ecstatic. My mom would tell me later in life that I would not stop bouncing around the house for weeks on end. I'm sure it eventually got annoying for her and my older brother Zach, but at the time, I was too lost in the moment to care. We were going to see those dinosaurs in the flesh. Or as much in the flesh as an animatronic ride can allow. We arrived at our Disney resort in the middle of fall, just when it was starting to snow back home. But not so late that Florida was not still warm. I remember the heat blasting my face as we exited the airport, and the air conditioning in the shuttle bus right after honestly gave me whiplash. Zack just seemed to be bored on his way to the hotel, but I gazed out the window intently, looking through all the Mickey ears and coaster tracks and parade floats for anything scaled, anything that would hint to the reptiles I so dearly loved. You can imagine my disappointment when, as we were settling into bed that night, I learned the Animal Kingdom, in which the dinosaur ride was located, would be our very last day at the parks. That would mean my plan of riding it enough to get the full scope of what we were dealing with was now squashed. And I would probably only get to ride it once or twice anyhow, as Zack said the lines were ridiculously long. I lay dejected in my Disney-themed pajamas that night, staring at the combo of moonlight and security lights through the hotel blinds. It was like this over the coming week that I would come up with my own plan. Don't get me wrong, the rest of Disney was magical as well. We went to all the major sights and rides through each of the four parks, even water parks too. We got our photos taken with the numerous character icons perusing the streets. Even Zack started to lighten up too. I caught him grinning when a parade happened to go by, and being 15 years old, he would blush whenever a princess waved at him. By the third day, he took his hoodie down and didn't groan at all when Mom asked him to go on a ride with me. He and I had been growing distant for a couple of years due to our age gap, 
but I feel like that trip really took us back in time to when he would play with me like we used to. He really let his inner child come out, even grabbed his own set of Mickey ears before we left. Maybe that's why he didn't hesitate too much in going along with my plan later on. I let it slip as we were coming out of the Toy Story ride. The one where you shoot at stuff. Hey, Zack, I said, nudging his arm. Yeah? I want to ride that dinosaur ride tomorrow as much as I can. He looked at me thoughtful. I know you do, Bug. His old nickname for me, since I used to wear thick glasses that bugged out my eyes. His face then split into a grin, one that he had whenever coming up with a bit of mischief. Want to do something crazy? He knew I did. My plan was simple, but Zack made some additions that years later, we both realized were really stupid. I wanted to sneak into the ride and slip away without my mom realizing. Zack proposed we duck under the seat so the ride operator would let us go as many times as we wanted or find some way to loop around that wasn't getting back in line. Eventually, though, we landed on the most reckless idea yet, one that would definitely get us in trouble or even banned from the entire area if we were caught. We'd sneak out of the ride near the end if it wasn't too fast, then find a way to slip back in from between the animatronics near the beginning. This way, you'll really get to see them up close, maybe even pet one, Zack teased as we brushed our teeth for bed. I grinned. Tomorrow, I would see these real-life dinosaurs as close as I could get, or we'd fail miserably. One of the two. The animal kingdom was just as awesome as the rest of the parks. We went on a jungle rescue, safari tours where the real animals could walk around as freely as though we were really on the plains, and even a prehistoric-themed cafe. We sat next to a moving baby mammoth as we ate. It was my favorite part of the day but I knew the best was still yet to come. I kept giving what I hoped were discreet winks at Zack across the table. I had no idea what was coming, though. Around late afternoon the next day, I was staring at a giant model of Aladar the Iguanodon outside the ride. The sun streamed red and yellow behind the trees, illuminating his scales and green eyes. While the line moved, we were greeted by two scientists in white lab coats on a projection screen, one sitting at a high-tech computer while the other stood with a clipboard and pen. They gave us the whole spiel about our destination being the early Cretaceous period. They were going to be our guides while we traveled through time. Zack nudged my arm and I laughed. We boarded the ride, Zack and I in the middle and our mom in the row in front of us. We made sure to sit at the end so we could try and slip away easier. The ride itself was pretty amazing. I really enjoyed it. It all flew by, though, and seemed so short. I only got to feel a glimpse of everything by the end, and I could barely remember the events that happened, although that may have been because I was way too excited. I knew as we were stopping along the track that it was time to put my plan into action. Let's go! After checking that no one was looking, and our mom was lost in the crowd, we managed to slip out without anyone seeing, and onto the dark set. Zack, being a responsible older brother, held my hand to make sure I didn't trip or get myself hurt, until we got to a more lit section of the ride, right by one of those triceratopses, I think. I reached out and patted its spiked nose. It was rough and surprisingly warm. Its horns were really solid, too. It was a deep brown color. Its eyes looked dead while not lit up and moving. I moved on to pet most of the other smaller dinosaurs, taking in every detail, every scale pattern, even Aladar all the way at the back. Suddenly, a loud mechanical hiss sounded far down the cavernous ride. The workings under their skin began to twitch. Zack immediately put the pieces together and grabbed my hand. The ride's going again, hide! We dove into some plastic ferns and squeezed ourselves as far back as we could go, praying that no one would see us as the cars went by. The music and roars of the dinosaurs were deafening. Zack covered his ears and hunched down, covering me with his black hoodie. I still remember the smell pressed against my nose. Mothballs. There was a carnotaur lit up in reds and blues snapping at the audience. That one quickly caught my eye. He would be the next one I looked at up close. I gazed over at the glistening yellow teeth, 
and wondered what they'd feel like. I wondered if they were actually sharp, considering the ride was not actually supposed to bite anyone. After the ride quieted down again, I crawled my way over to the large animatronic and quickly made the biggest mistake of my life. I examined around the nose area, looked at the eyes, and wedged my hand into the gap between its teeth. Its mouth was rubbery and cold, and while the teeth weren't pointed, they still made my skin go numb after a minute of feeling around. I wanted to see how far I could actually go in. Would I be able to feel the back of a throat, or was it all just empty space and robotics? I ended up making the second biggest mistake of my entire life. I pushed my tiny arm into its mouth as far as I could possibly go. I managed to get it almost up to the shoulder before it started to hurt. It was an awkward angle. My arm was straightened slightly upward, and I had to brace myself against the animatronic to stand. Zack caught up with me and said he wanted to take some pictures to show his friends. He told me to make funny faces, as though the dinosaur was in the middle of eating me. I did, twisting myself to face the camera this way and that. All the while, my arm was in the gigantic mouth. When we were done, Zack said, All right, let's get out of here before it picks up again. I remember replying, but I found that I couldn't move. I pulled and pulled, but I couldn't get my arm out from between the rubber teeth. It had gotten stuck. My shoulder was really starting to hurt from the strain. As I twisted my arm around, I couldn't feel much except for pins and needles. I'd gone numb. I can't get it out, I said, my voice extremely small. Zack was starting to get annoyed. We're done, come on, let's get out of here. I can't get it out, I said, louder this time. Zack, my arm's stuck. I never got to finish that sentence, though. The ride whirred to life, and something in the mechanical body shifted. The mouth clamped down over my arm. It dug into my skin. I could feel something sharp and mechanical jam into my hand inside its throat. There was no way I could describe the pain that followed. I screamed. I don't even really remember that much, except for something wet, warm, and sticky flowing down my arm. Zack told me sometime later that the animatronic had done a motion releasing my arm, but my hand was stuck in the mechanisms. He then told me he had to watch as I was picked up by my wrist and flung around extremely hard right as a car went by. I remember him screaming, oh my god, over and over. The ride instantly stopped. Zack came out of hiding, screaming for someone to help me. People were frantic. Someone tried to remove me from the thing's mouth but a cast member stopped them, saying it would only make things worse. I was dangling limp and unconscious. Blood covered my shirt and caked the inside of the dinosaur's mouth. Zack said that was the scariest part, how much blood there was, and how I wasn't moving at all anymore. I woke up in the hospital hours later, with my mom and Zack right there. I had come away with a wrist broken in multiple places, a dislocated shoulder, and slicing off three of my fingers, but amazingly I was still alive. The doctor said to my mom that I was lucky that was all that happened. The flinging and the pressure on my arm could have caused much more damage, maybe even caused me to bleed out or sever an artery. She told me all she could do was nod and cry. Obviously our big trip was cut short. Zack and I were grounded more than we'd ever been before after we got home and my injury slowly healed over time. I obviously have some major motor issues in that hand, but otherwise I get around okay. Although I still love the movie, I had to go into another room whenever the Carnotaur showed up on screen. I just couldn't look at them anymore. I'm a lot older nowadays, and look back on that incident as a cautionary tale. In theme parks, even places like Disney, those rules to stay inside the vehicle are there for a reason. I grew up a military brat in San Diego, California. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 25 years, eventually reaching the rank of gunnery sergeant. Before he retired in 2011, I'm really proud of him and I love him very much, but I won't sugarcoat it at all. Growing up with a parent in the military was not easy. He wasn't home much, and when he was, he was something of a disciplinarian. 
I didn't have nearly as much freedom as some of my friends did, but that was just as much of a boon as it was a burden. It really helped me to stay on track at school and gave me the means to get into a good college later on in life. Without a doubt, though, the worst part of him being in the Marine Corps was when he had to go away to war. Although he wasn't part of the initial invasion force, my dad was deployed in Iraq in June of 2003. I was 11 years old at the time, and it really sucked having to say goodbye to him, no matter how much he tried to reassure us he would be okay. I was old enough to be acutely aware that that might be the last time we ever got to talk to him, the last time I ever got to hug him, the last time I'd ever get to see him alive. Needless to say, the next six months were some of the most stressful of my entire life. Every little news report I saw on TV gave me the worst anxiety. Every time we got news a serviceman had died over there, I feared for the worst. Mom tried to shield us as best she could, but at the risk of sounding a little full of myself, I was smart, inquisitive, and sensitive as a kid, and she could only do so much to keep me from worrying. So it was that in September of 2003, Mom decided to take me to Disneyland for the weekend to take my mind off of things. To be honest, it was exactly what I needed. I was hugely into Disney when I was a kid, and although I'd been over to Disneyland a few times before, being so stressed around the house meant seeing it again was like doing so through fresh eyes. I took pictures with as many of the characters as I could, and each ride me and my mom went on seemed to alleviate my anxiety and depression that much more. The whole first day was going wonderfully well. That was until we got in line to ride the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I'm pretty sure it was at about 11.30 by the time we got into the little rail cars for the ride itself. Everything was going smoothly at first. We were speeding along all the twists and turns, till we hit the little fake desert setup, and then an incline into a dark tunnel. I just remember feeling this jolting sensation shake the cars, all while we were in the dark. Then this horrible grinding of metal, and a thud, before the people in cars in front of us started screaming, and everything came to a sudden stop. Everyone was really shaken up from this, but then I heard some of the worst things I've ever heard before in my life. This woman started calling out, Mark? Mark, wake up! We were all mostly in the dark, but there was a little bit of light coming from the openings of the tunnel on each side of us. I remember seeing how some of the cars weren't even on the tracks anymore. The cars in front of us were all wet and shiny, with some kind of fluid. I would only realize later it was someone's blood. In the moments after the rail cars came to a stop, people started clambering out of them and walking down the tunnel as fast as they could, calling that someone was hurt really bad and we needed help up there as soon as possible. My mom climbed out of the rail car and followed. I could see that the train car thing at the very front of the coaster had derailed and the rear of the thing had mounted the car behind it. It was only then that I realized that whoever was in the car just behind it would have taken the full force of that thing as we sped up that incline. There were also people in the cars ahead of us who were trapped by it, stuck in the rail cars and unable to get out because of the way they were positioned in the tunnel. Thankfully, me and my mom weren't trapped, so we could just get out of there. I think it took another half hour before firefighters could get them all out, so paramedics could treat them before taking them to the hospital. All the people that could get out were herded off by park staff toward the River Bell Terrace, where a medical treatment area had been set up. Like I said, me and my mom were mostly okay, just a little shaken up from the whole thing. But there were people with some very serious injuries who had not been so lucky. We later found out the guy at the very front who'd been in the first car had actually died. It's horrendously tragic that someone should lose their life when all they wanted to do was go to Disneyland and have a bit of fun on a few roller coasters. I know it's kind of messed up for me to think like this, but we got really lucky that day. Way more people could have died. Honestly, I was really surprised to find out that only a single person lost their life in that incident. 
At least half the riders on the coaster could have been killed from the way that train straight up mounted the cars behind it. Since that day, I've never ever ridden a roller coaster, and theme parks in general just kind of creep me out now. I know they're super fun, and I hope I'll get past my fear of them one day, but for the time being, I'm more than happy to just avoid them and stay safe. Even the sound of people screaming on them reminds me of Big Thunder Mountain, and the way that woman just kept screaming for her husband or son or whoever it was to wake up, and they never did. Back in 1999, I used to work at Disney World down in Orlando, Florida. I was a custodian, which is really just Disney World's fancy way of saying janitor. We mostly worked when the park was closed. We'd clean the place up, empty the trash, and treat all the water features around the park with cleaning chemicals to keep them from getting stagnant and smelly. There was also a little guest interaction involved too though, including things like giving directions, helping guests plan their day, and answering the millions of questions they'd have about the park. I suppose that means the job was 70% janitor and 30% walking information point. There were major perks, but there were huge downsides as well. I'd get disgruntled guests coming up to me and complaining about the stormy weather, as it meant some of the rides were closed down for a few hours. I'd have to deal with that by just smiling and nodding and sympathizing, but sometimes I swear it was like they wanted me to clap my hands and magically make the clouds disappear from above our heads. It was like they imagined I had the power to do anything. Like, it's not my fault you chose to visit Disney World during a freaking hurricane season, dude. Make better choices in the future. I also had to deal with lost children a few times, too. I had to take valuable items to the lost and found in Main Street, which was pretty fun, as it meant you could really wander throughout the Magic Kingdom on your way to the lost and found. And that was one of the good things about being a custodian. You're allowed to walk all over the place within reason. For instance, if a guest wanted directions to Space Mountain, I could walk them over to Tomorrowland instead of just telling them how to get there. This worked well when trying to communicate with guests who didn't speak much English. I had a lot of good times during that job. The whole team was like one big family, but I suppose that's why what I'm about to tell you happens to be probably the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire life. It still kind of messes me up even 21 years later. So this happened on the second weekend in the February of 1999. The actual park opened at 11 a.m., so we used to spend the first two or three hours of our shifts basically doing cosmetic cleans, testing rides, and making sure the park was ready to go for the day. The morning section of my shift involved helping out with the cleaning and prepping in Tomorrowland. At one point, I'm walking through the park, and I see this guy up on the platform for the Skyway in Fantasyland. He's sweeping away, whistling to himself, generally being the cheerful guy that he was. Ray was in his 60s at the time, and he had already been with us for like a year. Everyone liked him a lot. He was older than most of us, but he was super chilled out and friendly, always willing to help out his fellow cast members. Like I said, we were one big family. We worked together, we partied together, some of us even lived together. I called up to him. Morning, Ray Ray. He smiled down at me, returned the greeting, and waved a little before going back to his sweeping. It was a beautiful morning. Everyone was in a good mood. It was another day in paradise. In my mind, at least. So I'm walking toward Tomorrowland for a few more minutes, when I hear this slow electric whirring sound above my head. It was the sound of the Skyway starting up as the four-person gondola started moving along the track. I still felt terrible that it took me as long as it did to realize what was so wrong about this situation. It was a Sunday morning, and I was pretty tired already and slightly hungover from having gone out drinking the night before with a few of the other cast members. Honestly, it took me a while to stop blaming myself for not having prevented what happened next because I always figured if I'd been just a little bit sharper, 
I'd have been able to really help out. Then it hits me, though. The gondolas are moving pretty fast on their first test loop, and Ray was still up on the platform. Someone had switched the skyway on without checking to make sure if it was clear or not. I started running back the way I'd walk following the platform the skyway was on and hoping I'd catch up to Ray before the gondola reached him. I was running as fast as I could, trying to catch up with the lead gondola, but I just couldn't seem to close the distance in time. I looked up and saw Ray whistling away to himself with his back toward the gondolas, not seeing them at all. They were quickly approaching. I started shouting to him and trying to warn him before the gondola knocked him off the skyway platform, which was 60 feet up in the air. He heard me and turned around, obviously horrified to see that someone had turned on the skyway before checking to see if it was clear. He had a mix of anger and fear in his voice as he turned back around and started moving as quickly as he could away from the gondola. He just couldn't move fast enough, though. The thing caught up with him quickly. It didn't knock him off right away. He grabbed onto the gondola and tried to pull himself inside of it to stop himself from falling, but he just didn't have enough strength. All of a sudden, I'm watching him dangling from the thing, in danger of falling the whole 60 feet onto the concrete below. I'm just shouting up to him, Hang on, Ray, just hang on! There was nothing I could do. I had to watch him struggle to hold on to that gondola as it moved along the skyway, knowing it was only a matter of time before he lost his grip and fell. I could see Ray looking over his shoulder, down at the ground below every so often. I'll never forget that look of absolute terror on his face, or that feeling of pure helplessness as I watched this whole thing unfold. Then the gondola started passing over these flower beds instead of just pure concrete. I figured the soil and plants would have been a better option to fall onto. It had to be. I started shouting, Jump, Ray! Jump into the flower beds! Let go! I don't know if he deliberately let go or just lost his grip, but he fell the whole 60 feet down and landed with an audible thump in the flower beds below him. Watching him fall was like slow motion. He seemed to fall so slowly, but I guess that's just because it was such a long way to fall. He was in a bad, bad way when I reached him. He wasn't moving at all. He laid there among the flowers, glassy-eyed, wheezing and groaning in agony. In the moment before I ran off to get help, I saw him spit up blood onto his bottom lip and chin. I was in tears by the time I found another cast member to help, begging them to call 911 so we could get an ambulance out as fast as possible. Emergency services got there less than 20 minutes later. They carried Ray out of the park on a stretcher before driving him over to Orlando Regional Medical Center. We all prayed that he'd be okay. It brought us a great deal of hope that he'd actually landed on the flower beds and not straight onto concrete, which would have definitely killed anyone who had fallen that far. Unfortunately, a few hours later, we got word that he hadn't made it. His injuries were so bad that he passed away, despite all the hospital staff had tried to do for him. The fall had caused too much trauma, too much internal bleeding. He had slipped away before they'd even operated on him to drain the blood from his lungs. We were all absolutely devastated to have lost such a cheerful, charming, and dedicated man. Ray made all our days just that little bit brighter, and it would be impossible to really ever replace him. I felt for his family. I felt for his friends. I really felt for the cast member who had turned on the gondolas before making sure the skyway was clear. Technically, Ray should have been done with his sweeping by that time in the morning, but like I said, he was dedicated and the kind of guy who didn't finish a job until it was properly done. And the person who turned on the skyway, whose name I won't mention, was completely inconsolable so much that they had to be put on leave before they eventually quit. They blamed themselves for Ray's death, saying they should have checked the cameras, done a walk around to make sure the platform was clear. It was no one's fault, though. I've come to terms with that. It was a simple breakdown of communication. It could have happened to anyone. It wasn't my fault, it wasn't Ray's fault, and it wasn't the operator's fault. It was a horrible twist of fate. Everyone that could get time off attended Ray's funeral. We all wanted to be there for his family as best we could, 
to assure them their husband and father was one of the best men we'd ever known. Ray was the first cast member to die in the park in over 10 years. A little memorial was put up backstage for him so we could all remember him at his best with a smile on his face instead of scared and broken. Rest in peace, Raymond Barlow. We love you and we miss you every single day. It's every kid's dream to go to Disney World, right? It's a dream a lot of American kids never get to have come true, let alone British ones. So I always felt extremely fortunate and privileged that my parents were not only financially capable of taking our family over to Florida for a couple of weeks, but also that they could actually put aside the time to do something like that. In all likelihood, they probably didn't want to. I mean, no offense to anyone that does, but what kind of actual grown-up wants to spend all their time queuing up for rides and baking in the hot sun after paying for overpriced churros and chocolate sauce? That's not even touching on the pure scam that kind of stuff can be. You remember Disney dollars? But my parents relented to mine and my sister's pleas to take us all the way across the Atlantic to arguably the craziest state in the Union. Florida. This happened a long time ago, back in 1998, so excuse me if I misremember any of the smaller details about the park itself. I remember the year pretty clearly, though, because the game StarCraft had just come out. I was fortunate enough to pick up a copy in the US before it was even commercially available in the UK. To a 10-year-old like me, Florida was the land of the lost or something. I mean, it had actual dinosaurs, i.e. alligator farms where you could feed the big old beasts with hunks of meat, something I was way too scared to do myself. I was happy to watch my dad do it though before he scampered away down the wooden walkway like he was regressing into a childlike state of pure primal fear. It was the land of Tropicana, where food proportions dwarfed those in the UK. The grass and trees were different and fantastical. So much so that I might as well have landed in an alien world. It was also the home of the most magical place in the entire universe, Disney World. It was during our third and final day trip to Disney World, though, that something happened I didn't properly understand until I was a great deal older. In the truth of the event, my parents tried their best to shield me and my little sister from. So, this is how it happened. I remember we were in the Animal Kingdom part of the park. I was always really interested in natural history when I was growing up, so I was particularly excited to see this portion of Disney World. I was incredibly happy and excited to be there. Of course, I'd had to wait three whole days at Disney before we finally got to see this particular part of it. Every other kid seemed to be just as happy as I was. As we got off the shuttle bus out at the park, I remember seeing this one little girl with her dad, who looked uncharacteristically miserable for a kid who had the good fortune to be visiting Disney World. I mean, there's always one moody kid out of the bunch though, isn't there? One who never seems to have any fun no matter what's happening around them. Honestly, as confused as I was about her, I forgot the sight pretty quickly. My own excitement was overwhelming me, at seeing my favorite Disney film animals, like Mustafa from The Lion King. Go figure, I was on a buzz throughout the entire day. Whether we were on the rides or on the safari tour thing, or eating at one of the cafes, I'd constantly see this little girl and her dad. She looked consistently exhausted and unhappy. I found myself staring to the point where my mom and dad had to warn me to stop staring at other kids because it was rude. I knew they were right, of course. It was rude to stare. Besides, this girl seemed awfully upset for some reason. Surely seeing me staring at her would only make it worse. A little while later, I remember walking along drinking one of those ginormous zillion ounce sodas or whatever. Happy as Larry, when I see that little girl and her dad in front of us again. I'm not going to pretend to be all like I knew something was wrong or that I sensed it because I didn't at all. One thing that struck me as kind of odd about this whole thing at the time, though, 
One thing did kind of strike me as odd, though. By the time I was 10, I hated holding my mom or dad's hand. That was what babies did. This girl didn't seem to be all that keen on holding her dad's hand either, and at one point even tried to shake it loose, but he kept on holding her. At one point, he even started to grip her wrist and telling her to behave. I found this kind of distressing. I looked up at my dad as if to be like, are you seeing this? Half expecting to be told to stop staring again. Both of my parents looked very concerned about what was going on though. I didn't dare to say anything. I was old enough to know that some kids misbehave sometimes, and people around had that kind of cringy, pretend it's not happening kind of feeling about them. Only, instead of calming down, the little girl burst into tears and started wailing, I want my mommy over and over, all while the guy was trying his best to calm her down. I'll get you to mommy soon, sweetie. All this other stuff he was saying too. What happened next is kind of a blur in my memory. There was a lot of commotion around. This is how my dad tells the story from his perspective though. Apparently, while the little girl was waiting, my dad heard her blatantly say, I want my dad. Where is my dad? The way he tells it, the mood in the crowd around us visibly shifted. It became obvious that this guy who had been taking her around the park was not her father. No one knew how to actually act on this revelation for the first few moments or so, and for good reason. Maybe the guy was an uncle or a family friend, a legal guardian or a caretaker. There was nothing inherently insidious about it, until the guy snapped back at her in a way that was distinctly unparental. Some other American dad walked up to him. Is there a problem, buddy? The guy was quick to calm the situation down by telling them the girl was just having a temper tantrum. When someone asked the guy if he was actually the girl's dad, he replied yes he was, again trying to reassure the gathering crowd that everything was okay and she was just having a tantrum. The next part I remember pretty clearly though. The girl shouted something before the man clamped his hand over her mouth so hard it sounded like a slap. My mom started pulling me and my sister away from the scene. It was starting to turn ugly, like really ugly, really fast. According to my dad's version of the story, what the girl had screamed before the guy tried to shut her up was that he wasn't her dad at all. Not only that, but he had taken her away from her dad. All kinds of people started rushing forward, and my view was blocked off. There was shouting and moving. I remember seeing this tubby woman shoving her way through the crowd of people with that same little girl in her arms, who by that point was sobbing uncontrollably. A crowd had formed around the man, and it began to sway and shift. There were shouts and screams. I mean, the kind of screams that were so intense and frightening, they made me shake and shiver in fear. My little sister was bursting into tears, too. By the time park security showed up, who ten-year-old me assumed were the police, the crowd began to disperse. I distinctly remember seeing the man who had taken the little girl from God knows where, pinned on the ground with someone on top of him. That's the thing I remember most crystal clear to this day. A lot of my memory has been filled in with my mom and dad's retelling of the event, but the image of that guy's rage, how it twisted up his facial features, is still burned into my mind. It's been made all the more sinister by the fact I now know what he was so angry about. He'd taken that little girl and kept her pliant because he'd promised her a trip around Disneyland. She was probably so keen to go that she hadn't fought back. God knows what he was intending to do with her afterward. Luckily, that chance was taken away from him by a bunch of do-gooders. At least that's the way I imagine he thought of it playing out. It's sick his long game of lulling his prey into a false sense of security before he finally had his way with her. Not that I realized any of this at the time. To a ten-year-old, it was all just one big mess of confusion and fear. I knew that whatever was going on was very, very wrong. We have no idea what happened to the man or the little girl after. No one spoke of it again for the rest of the holiday. I'm pretty sure it was almost five or six years before one of them brought it up with me and explained exactly what the situation had been. As far as I knew, all I'd seen was a dad mistreating his daughter, who'd then been arrested for it. Even to this day, it still screws with my head. 
that one of the most horrid things I ever witnessed happened in what was billed as the happiest place on earth, and if things had gone just a bit differently, that girl could have been a corpse or worse just a few days later, and nobody would be any the wiser. Thank God she had the courage to speak up when she did, and thank God there were good people around that reacted the way they did too, because I don't even want to imagine the alternative. So a few summers ago, the old ball and chain and I took the kids down to Florida for a week or so so they could visit Disney World. It was a win-win situation. It would actually stop hounding us to take them there, while us grown-ups could soak up for a while in the tropics. A whole seven days to experience what an actual summer feels like. Don't get me wrong, I love my native state of Maine, but the only thing scarier than a Stephen King book is the weather there. As the saying goes, don't like the weather in New England, all you gotta do is wait a minute. So we're down in Orlando for the week, and the arrangement is that we'll spend three days at Disney World, with a day on either side where the grown-ups will do fairly grown-up things together. So we're walking around the city seeing some sights, baking in the Florida sunshine. I get the one thing I'd really been after, which was a huge Cuban sandwich. The kids are being corralled by their mother, while I'm trailing behind trying not to pass out from ingesting my body's weight in pork, bread, and cheese. At one point, my wife needed to use the bathroom, so I was in charge of keeping an eye on the kiddos. She ran off to find somewhere that had let her use the restroom without making her open her purse. Now, admittedly, this is where I fell short of being my best as a father. I found a bench nearby and sat my ass down on it. I told the kids to stay where I could see them, which, since I shut my eyes and started sunbathing like the disgusting, greasy lizard person I was, was a little bit redundant. Next thing I know, I was just about to doze off when I kind of jerked out of my haze. I had to check on what the kids were doing. I get up and look around. I see my son halfway down the street, talking to some guy dressed up as Mickey Mouse. I knew that characters appeared outside the parks on occasion, but all the way downtown in Orlando, I was a little bit confused, but more relieved than anything. They hadn't disappeared into thin air at least, which would have ruined more than just a vacation, I can tell you that much. I'm walking towards old Mickey, when I started to realize there was something not quite right about him. The Mickeys in the park were all super animated, having theatrical movements to keep the kiddies entertained. This one was anything but. While my kids were basically dancing around him, wicked excited to see him outside the park, Mickey was just kind of staring at them, almost like Mickey Mouse had taken a few Mickey pills. Sorry, that's a dad joke. Comes with the territory, I'm afraid. It's only as I started to get closer, though, that I really started to see how this particular Mickey here wasn't just acting wrong, he looked wrong, too. It wasn't just that. The shape and color of his copyright-dodging costume was all off-kilter. It was pretty damn filthy, too. I mean, I get those things must not be the easiest thing in the world to wash and clean, like I'm pretty sure the head won't fit in a washer-dryer or something but this thing was covered in dirt and old stains. It was seriously gross. I dread to think about what that thing must have smelled like on the inside. Look, I'm not a total jerk. I understood, or at least thought I understood, what the deal was. This guy was in a knockoff suit. No one in a financially stable situation chooses to wear stinky old Mickey the Rat costumes or whatever and parades themselves around downtown Orlando. I figured this was a dude half-exhausted and heat-stroked looking to make money by taking photos with the kids or something. I reached into my wallet and went to hand him a 20. The guy just kind of looked at me. Or rather, the guy didn't, the head did, which I didn't anticipate. It was so creepy, this pair of big, black, lifeless eyes just staring me down from a few feet away. It seriously rustled my jimmies. I kind of thrust the 20 in his general direction. Like, hey dude, come on, take the money already. 
the guy actually tilted his head at me like he was in a well-rehearsed horror movie scene or something. I responded by putting the 20 back in my wallet so as to not offend him any further. I called my kids back to me. Their mom was probably wondering just where in the world we'd gotten to. Of course, they were all like, Oh, come on, Dad, can't we play with Mickey a little more? Well, Mickey goes back to staring at them, which obviously was making me super uncomfortable now. I insisted in my best stern dad voice that they would do as they're told right now, or I'd be telling their mom on them. She's the tough one after all. As they went to walk away, Mickey reached out to try and grab my seven-year-old son. Red line crossed right there. Don't touch the kids unless I know you. I stepped up to the guy and stated that he had no right to lay a hand on my kids, especially not in that fake Mickey suit. The man just took to staring at me again. The whole time he'd not made a single sound. I took both my kids by the hand, who were getting pretty distressed at this point, since Dad was being mean to Mickey. Mickey wasn't exactly being his cheerful self either. I made a show of apologizing to the man for being curt with him, then tried to make it one of those teachable moments as I walked away with my kids, making it clear to them that no adult is allowed to touch them without their express permission and that strangers are most definitely not allowed to touch them even if it's Mickey. Always tell mom and dad if they do. Then though, I made the mistake of looking over my shoulder, where I see old Mickey is still staring at me, and somehow managing to be even creepier than before. That night, I just couldn't sleep. I was not used to how humid Florida would be. Our motel room's air conditioner had been very well behaved all week, but picked that night of all nights to start malfunctioning, Thank God the kids' rooms unit was still working hard, but ours not so much. I ended up getting out of bed and sitting at the little table in the kitchenette where I drank a glass of something. I was just trying my best to cool down so I could get back to sleep. We had the flight home the next day, so I needed to be as sharp as possible so I didn't screw up and lose the boarding passes or whatever. Just so you know, the motel we were staying at was all bungalows, single-story units in a horseshoe shape. The one we were staying in happened to face the highway outside. I took a walk over to the window and took one final look at the floor. I walked over to the window and took one final look at the floor tonight. I loved vacationing here. I totally understood why it's the retiree's destination of choice. As I'm looking out through the blinds, though, I see something out there that made my jaw drop. Standing outside, silhouetted by the streetlights as still as a statue, over near the highway, was an obvious Mickey Mouse shape. The circular ears, the oversized hands, the whole works. I actually said no fucking way out loud. The realization hit me that knockoff Mickey Mouse Man from Orlando had somehow figured out where we were staying. Okay, so I had no idea how he managed to work that out. It's something I still think about from time to time. The only concrete thing I can imagine in my mind is that when not wearing that suit, he could have looked just like anyone, so maybe he followed us all the way back to the motel on foot, or in a car or something. I'd have no idea we were even being stalked by the same person. Like I said though, we left Florida the next day, and I only talked to the cops down there one time. I have absolutely no definite answers on how that guy found us, so I found myself rushing back to the kitchenette to grab a knife from the drawer, which might seem like an overreaction to some of you, but I can't overstate the fear I was feeling at that moment. Something happens when you're a dad, something where you're not willing to roll the dice with your kid's safety. So whatever was about to happen, there was no way I was going into it with just my fists. Knife in hand, I rushed back to the window and looked out to see that no one was there anymore. Note that I say no one and not nothing, because lying in the parking lot about a hundred meters closer to the motel room was the entire knockoff Mickey Mouse costume just lying there on the tarmac. I was staring at the damn thing in terror for a moment. This guy had stripped off his costume in 15 seconds and was now nowhere to be seen. What happened next is literally something out of a horror movie. 
I'm checking the peripheries of the parking lot, trying to spot this guy, when boom, he pops up right in front of the window and bangs his head onto the glass. Yes, his actual head. It was so hard I thought it would knock the entire pain out whole. I almost had a heart attack right there. Whatever yelping scream I made when the guy appeared immediately woke up the wife and kids. I told the missus to get in the kids' room and lock the door behind her, and call the cops as well, after which a few terrified questions pertaining to what was going on came. This window pane must have been made out of security glass or something, because this guy, who by the way was now completely naked from head to toe, just couldn't seem to break it no matter what he threw at it. His fists, his forehead, whatever it was just boomed and shook the frame. The whole time, I was waving my knife at him and shouting that the cops were on the way. He switched his attention to the door, trying to bash it open. As I rushed over to the kid's room and asked my wife if the cops had sent anyone yet, I heard her respond with yes. By the time I got back to the window, the banging had stopped and the empty Mickey suit was gone from the parking lot. I watched that parking lot until I saw the blue flashing lights approaching and only then was I really able to breathe properly. I gave statements to the cops who arrived and told them all about the earlier interaction I had with the man. I figured it would be pretty easy for them to find the guy who was butt naked if he didn't have this huge Mickey Mouse suit on, but like I said, it wasn't like we were there for much longer. The next day we caught the plane back home to Maine and back to reality. I had to get on the phone to Orlando police to see if there had been any developments at all, which to my surprise, there hadn't been. There hadn't been a single arrest relating to the incident that night, despite having questioned several Disney cast members, both current and formal. I know that might seem like a really anticlimactic way to end such a story. No one was caught, nothing was resolved, and I have absolutely no relevatory or illuminating piece of info to share with you. No twists like, oh god, the call was coming from inside the house or something. That really is where the story ends. The guy found us, he terrorized us, and then we left Florida. I suppose I can end it by saying I'm looking forward to going back at some point when the kids are older, and they have no interest in going to Disneyland, but definitely not anytime soon, and definitely not to downtown Orlando.